friends, I'm extremely honored to be uh, participating in this conference. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Skagan, for inviting me. I wish uh, it was taking place in a physical world. Uh, I love Scandinavian uh, food. I love Scandinavian. I don't love Scandinavian winter weather, but I like the food, the atmosphere, the warmth. So next time, hopefully, after the pandemic. So I'm gonna uh, rapidly now in the next uh, you know 10 to 15 minutes describe uh, our, uh, the, 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 my ideas uh, you know overall and explain why this pandemic is not a black swan contrary to all these claims uh, you hear in the press uh, thank God I don't read the papers I don't follow uh, the press on social media, so I'm immune to that. But I keep hearing friends telling me, hey, you know, this is the black swan. I was told this was the black swan. It is not a black swan. This pandemic has nothing to do with the black swan. As a matter of fact, the book, The Black Swan, explains to you that the pandemic was not a black swan. So let me describe uh, my work. Uh, as you see in the second slide, uh, I have uh, uh, five books called the Incerto that I bundled together. Why uh, five books in one? Because it forces me, uh, the, it's a discipline, it forces you to focus on one topic and only one topic and, and write non-overlapping treatments of it, uncertainty, in different aspects. And, 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 you, and I keep discovering more aspects, so I don't know if uh, a lifetime is enough for me to, 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 <laughs> to exhaust uh, uh, what I what I what, what I plan you know <laughs> to write uh, on uncertainty, so so you 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 I have contracted uh, some chapters of the separate books to put them in one uh, the inserto so I am the author of the inserto not the author of the black swan, uh, which was sub segment it's like a chapter almost in the inserto, so my background is unusual I was a pit trader. I started uh, uh, as a trader, as a mathematical trader, trading derivatives and options, and then moved to writing popular books, and then moved to doing uh, uh, academic uh, work in mathematical subjects. So, so basically, it's backward, uh, complete backward trajectory. But then again, when you start from practice and then go to theory, you see a lot of nonsense. But when you start with theory and then go to practice, you have all these tools in your head that you feel you must use. So, and, and things don't work the same way, which is why we have so many problems in the treatment of uncertainty in the literature. And why very often, I keep repeating, very often your grandmother, grand uncle, uh, great grandmother, great grandfather, uh, they know a lot more about uncertainty than many, many, many people who seem to specialize in it. So, uh, Let's see how, and let me uh, introduce basically the core of the Black Swan idea, uh, chapter two, volume two of the Incerto, with the distinction between mediocristan and extremistan. We live in extremistan for in many respects, in finance, for pandemics, for uh, uh, you know media stuff, things that have winner take all effects. We live in extremistan. But we think we live in mediocristan, and the tools you learn at school are so bad because they're grounded in mediocristan, hopelessly grounded in mediocristan, that if you know statistics, you don't understand the world. <laughs> or you may understand some stuff in the medical world, you may understand the distribution of height, but not that of wealth, not that of risk, not of the tail risk. So let me uh, explain. In the uh, Black Swan, I introduced the idea of mediocristan as follows, with a thought experiment. Say we build a, uh, a big scale somewhere, say in New York, and invite a random representation of the world, a random thousand people from the world. We bring them and weigh them on a scale uh, in New York before they have their big meals, so, so they're, they're still normal. So how much, okay, I say, and then you add to that uh, sample the largest human being you can find. How much of the total will, the, will, will that extreme be? We have extremes in weight. That person can be maybe five times uh, the average weight. It will not be more than half a percent of the total. So you have an extreme event, but because you have a thousand, your sample is a thousand, your portfolio, say, is a thousand people, randomly selected, 
adding one extreme will not change the total <laughs> by much. And if you go from 1,000 to 10,000, it would be what? Five basis points. If the person is five, to five times the average weight, if you can find some kind of zombie or some kind of uh, extraterrestrial, semi-extraterrestrial human, it's 10 times the size, it still doesn't make a difference. So what happens is your sample becomes large, as in portfolio theory, you get diversified. And your statistical properties are such that you can easily do so. So today I'm going to have a huge dinner. How much can I eat? How many calories? How many calories can I have in a single day? 4,000, 5,000? Impossible to have more than that. Let's say I consume between 800,000 and a million calories a year. So not a single day is going to make a difference for my weight. In a good sense, good or bad. Good, if I survive a very large meal, it's not going to make me uh, you know, gain a huge amount of weight. And if I try to starve myself for 24 hours or so, it's hardly going to make a dent. I'm not going to become thin uh, overnight. I'm not going to become overweight overnight. It's a cumulative effect of a lot of small stuff. That's what I call mediocre time. On the other hand, in finance, things are different. And in pandemics, things are different. Let's, uh, I remember when I was a trader, you have, you know, when I entered the pit, as you can see in the picture, you had, I had a, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, older traders, particularly those with a gray beard, come uh, to lecture me about what I should be doing, what I should not be doing, uh, and things like that. And I remember in an old ordinary fellow telling me, hey, come over here, kiddo. You see this guy over there? His name is Ed. Ed made eight million in eight years, which at the time was a lot of millions, all right, a lot of money. Eight million in eight years and lost them all in eight minutes. That was the open of the crash of 1987. He lost all, all his money in eight minutes. He said, okay, kiddo, now you can go. So I learned a big lesson that finance has very weird properties. See, when a plane crashes, it's horrible, horrible news. You have 50, 100, 200 people die. But in finance, you can have every single passenger of the plane in the past also die in the, finance, the equivalent because banks have lost in uh, 1982 and in 2007 more money than ever made in the history of banking. So not only they've lost, but they've lost everything ever made before. So the properties are different. As we can see now with the same thought experiment with a slide on Extremistan, is that if I had the same sample of a thousand people and look at their net worth rather than their weight. And say net worth, I have no idea what the net worth of a randomly selected uh, sample, uh, because if you don't have any, you know, too many Westerners or something like that, you're going to kind of get, or, or too many people from, <laughs> from, from uh, Northern California, you see, a lot of Americans have net worth of zero. So, but, and then remember, they have people in, 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 in different parts of the world making a living on a few dollars a day. So let's say 200000 So $200,000 net worth for the total. And you add to that sample the wealthiest person on the planet. It's not going to be 50 basis points of the total. That person would be the entire, uh, you know, they'd be a running error. $200,000 if you have $100 billion, is a running error. And then you go from from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000, does make a difference. That person will still be close to 100% and the rest will be around the air. So there are domains that I call extremistan that can deliver events that swamp all the rest of the properties. So basically the story for extremistan is in the extremes. That's what matters. 100 authors today on planet Earth make more than half of the income for authors. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in the fiction business, it's even worse. Okay, the, the, the years where, where uh, five uh, authors make, uh, make, make, make half the income depend, you know, when, when you have the Harry Potter story. So it's very concentrated. Uh, and the concentration is increasing. If you look at the income of soccer players, uh, football players, or you see over time, you see how you have winner take all effects. 
because of the media. Same with opera singers. Opera singers used to make middle class income, and now suddenly if you make all the money when you have the media and then the rest. So the lunar takeoff effect is accelerating because of connectivity. Because we lose this local effect for global uh, dominance, say, say if you have an island, uh, it will have uh, you know fewer species than a continent, but it will have many more species per square meter. Whereas a continent will have fewer species per square meter, okay, because a few species will dominate in the continent. So you have this loss of uh, local diversity in in a lot of things that makes winner take all. You know, dominate the globe like Google's dominating the globe. Now we have uh, uh, internet companies dominating. You know, it's, it, it is it is uh, 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 part of the process that was described in the Black Swan when I said that because of this connectivity, you have multiplicative effects such that that will increase. In the past, uh, you know, you had uh, the the plague. To travel because of low connectivity and low winner take all effects for uh, diseases, it would take maybe 180 years to reach some villages in Europe. Along the Silk Road, traveling was slow, maybe at best 30 kilometers a day. Today, one single conference in Las Vegas can attract people in some boring profession, say uh, dealing with uh, intestinal. Uh, uh, surgery or whatever, some kind of what is these weird thing that attract 10,000 doctors <laughs> from, say, 50 to 150 countries. They come to Las Vegas, spend four days, and redistribute the disease. So 48 hours later, you've done 180 years of spreading for past pandemics. And, and of course, some pandemics like uh, uh, even Justinian's plague, the, 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 the spots it did not reach today. <laughs> There's COVID has reached practically every spot on planet Earth, practically. So that comes from connectivity. Now, the mistake people make about COVID. I keep saying that the black swan said it was not a black swan. It was part of parcel of the system. It comes from, you know, so it's not, I mean, it's not unexpected. It should be part of it. We've had a lot of pandemics in history and there's no reason to believe that now we're immune, particularly that we're so connected. The, the, but there is another mistake people make that in the beginning of a pandemic to disrespect its statistical properties. When, uh, when we had Ebola, which could have been a threatening pandemic, uh, people were comparing, uh, like something as you see here, something as respectable as the economist was comparing uh, Ebola to uh, uh, diseases that are not multiplicative. Or in the next slide, you can see this fellow saying, oh, you know, you're worrying. In the, that was the beginning of COVID, and that was something I was fighting with my friends. Uh, he, they say, well, you know, the odds of dying, drowning in your swimming pool is higher than that of di drowning from COVID, which at the time probably was uh, factually right. But think about it. Okay, drowning in your swimming pool is not multiplicative. Therefore, you don't get extremist time. If I drown in my swimming pool, the odds that my neighbor drowns in her or his swimming pool has not changed. But if I get COVID, the odds of that people in my neighborhood getting COVID is, has increased by a thousand percent. So you realize that you cannot deal with multiplicated processes by looking at statistics that are static. <laughs> you have to look at the properties. You shall not compare mediocre stand to extremist stand. Next, you can see we, we just wrote a paper explaining this. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting that I wrote the Black Swan for the general public, and then you put in nature physics uh, some 14 years late after, you know, later, uh, 12 years after publication, a paper showing, proving the point of the Black Swan, where we show that pandemics really are the fattest thing. The most extremist stand is uh, our pandemics, more than the winner take all effect, much more than uh, uh, finance even. You got to worry pandemics, then wars, then some financial uh, financial uh, things. Uh, you know, if you're exposed to these things, if a financial uh, big losses in some domain. So, it pays to be paranoid. And uh, now, thank you for listening to me. Uh, I, I managed to make my point. Have an excellent day.
And thank you so much, Nassim Taleb. You're still with us and you're open to take questions from the audience. Great, thank you. And I'd like to bring in something from the beginning because you've proven the point that uh, the pandemic is not a black swan. But what is actually a black swan? We, we saw something that we haven't never seen before on the 6th of January in Washington as the mob attacks Congress. And is that, is, is Donald Trump a black swan? Okay, that was definitely more unexpected. But let me warn you about something about uh, misinterpreting or misunderstanding the black swan, or what is uh, the definition of a black swan. September 11, let me ask you, uh, was it a black swan? It was most likely a black swan for you, no? Yes. But it was not a black swan for uh, the people who were piloting these planes, for the terrorists. So it depends on your, it's very, very, I say it's, it depends on the observer. It's very subjective. If you know what's going on, okay, it's not a black swan. If you don't know what's going on, it is a black swan. So for these rioters, it was a, it's not a black swan because they knew that they were uh, attacking uh, this. I mean, if they knew, I mean, I, I'm not sure that they were too much into intellectual uh, games uh, but uh, or, 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 or uh, too much uh, to, you know into thinking but but uh, had they done a little bit of thinking they would realize it's not a black swan but for them but for definitely for the rest of us this, 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 this will stay in history as a big surprise and, and and i'm still shocked at what i saw and we're going to bring in some of the questions from the viewers now and then one of them is simply biggest risk to financial markets as you see it well, the, the, the problem with the pandemic, as they say, the problem with the pandemic isn't the pandemic, it's what we did about the pandemic. Actually, even before that, uh, we were, uh, we did not have worldwide, I mean, Norway is an exception, of course, but we worldwide did not have good financial discipline. And uh, pretty much every single government was already stretched. Uh, they had printed money in 2009 and uh, discovered the mechanism, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you print money with impunity, and, and you can do that for a while, and nobody's going to stop you, and then you'd be retired or dead when, when the effect would be shown. And I think the effect of the pandemic is uh, an increase in debt that is basically um, incurable. I, I don't know how we're going to cure it. Either you need a huge amount of growth or a lot of inflation. And, and this is pretty much an accounting <laughs> uh, statement. It's not even a speculative statement that when you have a lot of debt to absorb that debt, you need to grow or you need, uh, uh, unfortunately, you're going to get, uh, you're more likely to get uh, inflation. Sometimes you get, uh, as we did in the 70s, stagflation, which is both inflation <laughs> and uh, absence of growth. You, you are obviously one of our greatest experts on risk. And one of the warnings that you keep giving us is uh, don't use the wrong map. And what exactly does that mean here? Well, um, what it already started was with, with, uh, with pandemic. As I said in the beginning, people were not taking it seriously. Only the Chinese uh, initially, because it was happening in China, and then the Taiwanese or next door, and, 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 and literally now every single Asian country in, in, in uh, East Asia uh, has taken it very seriously. And look, they're operating, they're functional, they don't have lockdowns. Uh, most other countries... Uh, have uh, our experience in our national countries, Western countries, uh, North American countries, Latin American countries, uh, are suffering from not taking this thing seriously at the beginning. Uh, we've been warning my friends and I since January, and, and our problems were not uh, uh, the, the, you know, linked to the general public. Our problem was experts saying, hey, you know, statistically this is wrong, this is killing only 3,000, uh, this has killed 3,000 people, this is killing... Uh, at, at a rate that uh, smaller than car accidents, let's not take it seriously. And by the time we took it seriously, it was too late. So now hopefully with this vaccine, something will happen, but uh, you still think you gotta, we've got to be on our guards. And meanwhile, uh, East Asian countries are doing well and, uh, and, and they're pretty much over it. Mm. And, and you have made a lot of warnings against using too much economic theory and uh, that kind of thinking in handling a, a crisis. And 
Where, where, where can that lead us? Even outside the crisis, uh, you know, people using uh, risk management models or economic theories uh, for, uh, you know, managing risk, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a lunacy. I have, I've I spent, you know, my life fighting these methods. But people like metric because someone without any understanding of the markets can get a job and uh, and can be an economist and uh, can can uh, without experience and understanding of the markets. Uh, the problem is those who know markets don't have time to do equations, and those who do equations. Yeah, and, and with your experience, actually going from your life as a trader and becoming a scientist, what what has uh, uh, how much uh, use do you have from your practical experience? Well, I mean, the whole idea is skepticism should be uh, uh, essential. Like uh, I know from traders, uh, tell told you, skepticism, you learn it. When, when you start as a trader and then later on start doing theory you, uh, and, and doing the mathematics, uh, you know, actively doing the mathematics, you do the world differently. Uh, traders are profound and business people. Yeah. And uh, you've actually, you're actually gone quite far. You, you've asked us to scrap the Nobel Prize in economics, haven't you? Okay, we're waiting for the connection with uh, Nassim Taleb to, uh, to return, so I hope we can get the line up and running again. Hi, yeah, Nassim, is. can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, of course. Of yes, course. wonderful. And uh, we're just wondering about your uh, recommendation that perhaps we should uh, get rid of the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, why, why is that? Well, I mean, in 2008, 2009, I showed how all these methods, uh, particularly for risk management, developed by economists, caused the collapse because people use it's like you're, you're on a plane and you're using the wrong uh, tools. And then, of course, you're going to crash your plane unless you have the experience to look outside the window. And that's what happened. And, and there was no penalty for it. I, I just finished, I mean, I, I published my last uh, volume of the Inserto called Skin in the Game, in which I explained that the problem is if those who make the mistakes do not get punished by reality, they're going to keep, you know, because of the negative incentives, they're going to keep uh, uh, making these mistakes. So economists are never punished for being wrong. Uh, yeah. uh, we have a, a problem with the connection to uh, Mr. Taleb, Nassim Taleb. Can, can you, can you uh, yeah, hear me now? Problem. Yeah, I can definitely, yeah. I, can, I can hear you. Yes. Wonderful. And uh, we can hear you now as well. And uh, you were making a point. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, I said that if those who make mistakes, say economists, produce their own model, do not get a penalty for making these mistakes, then they're going to keep making them. And uh, that, is, that, is a, that is a problem. Whereas a business person who makes a mistake and goes bankrupt will no longer make that mistake. Uh, bad drivers tend to uh, perish in car accidents. They stop killing others. But, but a lot of economists kept making mistakes and staying in the game. So we have a lot of bonuses, but you would like to see more of on the other side? I would like to see that uh, those who make a mistake pay the price. Don't transfer the risk to others. And that has been happening now in economics forever, that they can make mistakes, they have good models, they get rewarded by the Nobel. So uh, there's no correcting mechanism. A, a restaurant that doesn't serve good food goes bankrupt, uh, whereas a, a restaurant critic you know, can be wrong all her or his life. Uh, but nobody takes a uh, restaurant critic seriously. You know, what counts is uh, you know, the, the P&L of the restaurant. Likewise, uh, we should not use the risk management tools by people who have nothing to lose when they are wrong. And there is a viewer who would like to ask you this question. Is there a way to get politicians and policymakers to have more skin in the game? Um, unfortunately, no. It, it is not possible because they have a different incentive. They engage in policies and then they retire. However, uh, there are structures that, that makes the politicians have more skin in the game and then what I call localism. Localism, as in Switzerland, if a person lives in a community, she or he will be more likely to do the right thing because they're going to live there forever. And they have their family, their uh, friends, and they get humiliated. So there is a, that's kind of the game humiliation if they make a mistake. 
uh, after their office. They say, you know, they, they, they build a bridge, the bridge collapses, the far away, uh, that doesn't work. So uh, you need a structure that's localist, and, and localism, the canton like in Switzerland, seem to accommodate that. Compare that to uh, Washington, where you have some bureaucrat using a spreadsheet and makes a mistake. The bureaucrat is anonymous, and uh, she or he will never know uh, you know, uh, about the, the, the full consequences because they're going to move on to another job. This is why centralized states don't work well. And luckily, Scandinavia is decentralized. First of all, we're starting off with small countries and decentralized. So in decentralized system, people socially have the check on them to prevent them from, uh, uh, from engaging in, 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 uh, in, in situations where they can transfer risk to others. And we have seen for some time the rise of the huge corporations. And w where do you think the balance is, balance is uh, going when it comes to local and, and global as we go ahead? Well, what happens with a lot of these corporations, the people who manage the corporations uh, often have skin in the game. They started it, their baby, they started it, and, and they have the downside. But um, after you know a while, uh, the, the person sells out or retires. And, and then you have professional managers, and these have all the upside, no downside. So there's no check on them. And this is why the mortality of corporations is huge. The uh, median life of a corporation today inside the S&P 500 is about 11 years, 10 to 11 years, and shrinking. Okay, And it tells you something about the structure of incentives. Take GM, for example. Take a lot of companies. Okay, They've had managers who were compensated beautifully, but then they left a lot of stuff on the books that later on turned sour. So, and they didn't have skin in the game. They were not clawed back. They kept their bonuses. Uh, they sit on a beach somewhere in some tropical place sipping margaritas, and, and life is good for them. But, but the shareholders have paid the price. And sometimes the taxpayer, when like I was, I was with the banks, it's the taxpayer that has to uh, uh, foot the bill at the end. And a lot of the people sending me questions now are wondering about how to build resilience. And could you give us a, uh, some clue, so an insight into how to build resilience against a fragile society? Okay, so what happened is that uh, a system that is over-optimized is not resilient. Okay, and, and the example I give, and I've given in the Black Swan and elsewhere, is the example of nature. Nature builds humans who have two kidneys, okay? Uh, it doesn't optimize. You only need one kidney. You only need one lung now. Okay, and, you know we can have this conversation on half a lung, but you have extra capacity just in case something wrong happens. So the the, the equilibrium in nature is to have two kidneys, okay, and, and 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 extra lung capacity, extra aerobic capacity, and stuff like that that you don't need, but maybe one day. An economist designing a human will give one kidney or perhaps zero kidney, say, no, let's borrow one. In other words, you could do dialysis. Why carry this all day long when you only need it once in a while? Okay. So uh, uh, to me, redundancy, okay, having a buffer, as with, uh, for example, the Norwegian uh, you know, generational, uh, you know, fund, having a buffer is good protection, and you should have a buffer. And if you, for example, have a second kidney, you need, don't need to predict the environment as carefully as someone who has just one or perhaps none. So you, it gives you some kind of uh, freedom in decision-making and in dealing with the future. Uh, so and th that's what's central, is having uh, redundancies where they're operational, uh, having a, a chain supply that's not uh, uh, fragile. Uh, there are metrics to, the, the, to determine if your uh, supply chain is uh, fragile. There's ways to figure out if your balance sheet is fragile. Typically, you have to have less, as little debt as possible. Okay. Contrary to what people believe, debt has destroyed companies. It looks as like if people have a, this illusion that things come from debt. Unfortunately, it's much more likely things do not come from debt. Uh, debt comes later. <laughs> it comes usually when companies have decided to uh, enter the phase in which they're going to milk the system, you know, their managers are going to milk the system, then die. I've asked some of the other speakers yeah. today about is there, is there an event that has changed or really influenced the way they see the world. What about you? Uh, October 19, uh, 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 1987, okay, the stock market crash in New York. I was a trader and I saw the large deviation. It was, again, winner-take-all effects. 
And uh, I was lucky that I liked then fat tails. I, I liked to benefit from, you know, uh, I understood extremist time just a little bit. And that, I came out of that event completely changed, okay, mentally, uh, uh, e even physically, <laughs> I would say. I was like, it's like a shock, like someone uh, uh, gave you a physical shock where you need a week to recover physically from, 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 from the importance of it. And, and, and since then, I've been, I think it's in the back of my mind all the time what I saw um, and, and the shock I could see in other people's faces. I was equipped, uh, you know, to, to, for it, because, but I didn't think it was going to be uh, that big. And, 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 but, but the system then was, was, was in a state of shock. You'd walk in the street, you'd see people crying. Uh, you know, they lost, you know, the, the, the nest egg. So this, this to me, was a formative uh, event as a trader. And then a lot of people recommend, we actually ask, what is the biggest mistake you have made, as we can really learn from that. And, and yes. do you have a I've mistake that you can share with us? Yes, I have plenty of mistakes. I'm having listened to advice uh, <laughs> uh, to my people uh, to not engage in some careers listening to advice. I should have, in other words, my tendency would have been to be even more into fat tales and, and people kept trying to reason. Coming up with some more questions from the audience here. And uh, skepticism and risk aversion are often close relatives, says one viewer. What is the guideline for identifying good risk? Great. So uh, I learned another lesson from a trader. Uh, again, he said one thing. He said, take all the risks you can, but make sure you're in tomorrow. So in other words, you have to uh, separate survival risk from... Uh, you know, should be in risk of survival, ruin risk from variation. So, and this is a, a, a lesson that 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 that, uh, that was a good lesson for me uh, to take uh, all the risks I could, but at the same time make sure I ensured survival, which is completely different. Completely different. You have to separate variation and small risk. And this again, financial models don't. They put them all in the same bucket. You see, and sometimes, and later in anti fragile, I explain that things that have a lot of volatility typically are less risky than things that don't have volatility. A hedge fund that blew up in 2009 that had no volatility, something high, called sharp ratio, very high, uh, you know, were, uh, uh, were uh, these are the ones that were hit the most, whereas funds that had volatility did not blow up as much. And you, you, can, you can see Washington systems. When you have currency fluctuation, uh, the systems works a lot better than when, when you don't. And uh, obviously, you say you say it pays to be paranoid. But where do you see the biggest risks today? I said pandemics and wars, okay, and financial uh, uh, deep financial problems, and, and and the rest is we we can handle. And some people talk about the climate. I don't know if if it's uh, uh, it's not my specialty. I don't see it. I don't see as much. Uh, uh, existential risk there as, as others do, but I, I so but there may be some, there are some, but to me, the three essential uh, risks are number one, pandemics, and have been in what I wrote the Black Swan. Pandemics, wars, followed by uh, a financial disaster. I mean, on the scale of Weimar, of people printing, printing, then you have something like uh, uh, gener generating a deep depression as we watched watch after Weimar in Germany, and we watched in the Green the Great Depression in the United States. So something of that sort, we have to worry about. We shouldn't worry about economic growth. We should worry about economic solidity. And that's very different. And the second, the, the, the thing that worries me, when I, when I go to bed, and, and let me mention this because it's central, I go to bed and I'm worried. I'm worried about the loss of entrepreneurship, the sense of entrepreneurship by over-education. A lot of people, they go, they study, and they no longer, uh, you know, think, understand that, that, that the Western uh, growth of the past 400, 500 years was, didn't come from bureaucrats who studied and then started something they learned at school, but by uh, uh, adventurers, uh, what, what Adam Smith called adventurers, actually, uh, entrepreneurs, that was the name, uh, adventurers, by Adam, given by Adam Smith. These people who really took risks and, and basically uh, fed others. And, and if we pulled a billion people out of poverty, it's thanks to entrepreneurship, uh, generating wealth on a planet, and and I'm, I'm 
I have fears that over the past 10 years, uh, the rate of entrepreneurship in, in a lot of countries uh, has not been good. And, and in the United States, for example, since the Obama years, we have had uh, small businesses have you know, been penalized in favor of very large conglomerates. And this is an interesting question. How do we solve that one, the lack of entrepreneurship that you see? Uh, cultural, teach people to fail. The, the kids people to fail. Where is the highest rate of bankruptcy on planet Earth? In the United States. And where in the United States? In California and Silicon Valley, or the technology sector overall. So encourage people to fail, make it culturally acceptable to fail. And, uh, and, and in a lot of places, well, people who study, they, they don't like to fail because they're trained to not fail an exam. So that is, that is the challenge, is teach them, tell them it's honorable to fail, but fail small. So you can do it seven times, as they say. Fail, but fail small. So you're obligated to take risks. If you have a failure, make sure it's a small failure. But what about education? Should we study less? No, my point, uh, I mean, you can look at uh, uh, Facebook, OK, drop out, OK, uh, Microsoft, drop out. Uh, Apple, <laughs> drop out. So uh, finally, uh, you, you can say, tell that you have to separate techne from episteme. Uh, techne is acquiring technical skills, and that's an education, but that one you don't get uh, with a professor who has read books. Okay, the environment's too complicated for that. But physics, no, you need university. We need both, but, but you have to also respect the notion of apprenticeship, and it looks like it's largely present in medicine, where basically the medical education is training on a job, and in the computer industry. But so we have to favor uh, uh, apprenticeships, uh, stuff like that, because that's the real education, much more than uh, someone having read uh, Marx, Kant, or uh, some sociology textbook. So learn to fail. Thank you so much, Nassim Taleb, for being with us.